Okay. All right. Hi. And then the your your. <laughs> One more time. You're listening to Keyboard and Quill from Star Tree, creators of the Real Time Analytics Summit and, and podcast. podcast. Hey, I'm Tim Berglund. And I'm Rachel Podreski. In this episode, we're going to explore the history of telecommunications, which is really about how we can extend our voice, first across a room, then a field, then oceans, and how that leads to the digitally connected world we live in today. So, you know, Tim, we're sitting here in a recording studio right now, talking to each other. I am using my voice, and you are using your voice. Well, let me just use my voice there and say, yes. Good. So if we think about those wiggly smartphones again, it's a little computer with a built-in radio that can extend the sound of our voice and the appearance of our face to just about anywhere on the planet. But nobody listening to this is probably impressed by the telephone. No, it's a little old hat. Maybe some of our oldest listeners can remember when these things emerged, but they were commonplace. Yeah, we're not especially young and they've been with us for our whole lives. But maybe it's worth stopping to think about just how ubiquitous these things have become. Just like the Industrial Revolution replaced metabolic power with machine power, the telecommunications revolution has replaced our voices Voices. with various parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Really has. It really has. And we're going to try to avoid talking about computers. That's a huge part of the story. But we're going to try to stay focused on extending the range of our voice. Now, there is not a whole lot of precision or consensus on when and exactly how human language began. If you look around, common estimates are like 100,000, 200,000 years ago, you know, you've got anatomically modern humans. At least that's, a, that's kind of a point in the timeline that we can sort of stick a flag for now. So some really early technology for extending the voice was uh, a megaphone, like a, a horn that you could speak into. So you can kind of start there. And even to extend that a little further, using drums and bugle-ish type instruments in battle was at least a Bronze Age phenomenon and is currently used regularly by my 11-year-old at home. (laughs) So this actually seemed to reach its peak in the Napoleonic era and has continued until radio rendered it obsolete. So the very long time we use these drums and bugles. A very long time. It was They're loud. They go farther than your voice can go. And, and there's this early technology using drums that could only emerge in a place where the languages were tonal. So there are these pitched drums used in West Africa. And the language group that's commonly associated with these drums is a language called Yoruba. You can hear these over a distance of about 20 miles. And the sources that I saw disagreed on when they emerged. Some of them said as early as the 6th century. And you can play these pitched drums to replicate the tones in the spoken language. You can't necessarily tell what word you're toning out, but you were, in a real sense, speaking the language with the drum. That is so cool. It is amazing. For a long time, this was the highest technology telecommunications device on the planet. And it was a while before anything else interesting showed up. After a short break, we'll peer into the history of the telescope. I'm Tim Berglund. This is Keyboard and Quill. We're going to keep going with our show on telecommunications with the telescope. So let's fast forward a little bit to 1792, when a Frenchman named Claude Chop set up a system using telescopes and semaphore flags. He had towers that would be positioned within the light of sight with a telescope at each tower to view the flags of the other tower. And they were doing the semaphore flag thing where they like held up one flag upright, one to the left and flippity floppity. For those who are not in the studio watching Tim hold up his right hand with his left arm stretched out. Yes, patterns of to, that to encode letters. It's very fun to watch. But anyway, we have a system of telescopes and it set the stage for the electronic telegraph. Okay, so... Early in the 1800s, there was a lot of work, a lot of innovation surrounding electricity. The, the school kid 
answer to who invented the telegraph is Samuel Morse. But the like 50 or so years prior to his famous 1844 message that got all the press, there were these various complex failed attempts. There was one in 1774. It was a Frenchman, and he devised a system where he could send text messages just from room to room. He didn't use very much wire, but he used 26 wires, not economically viable for scale. It's the idea. But still a paradigm we use today when we text our friend who is sitting in the next room. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so the first room to room text messages. Um, good old Carl Friedrich Gauss, known as a mathematician and a physicist, he actually made a working telegraph in his town in 1833. It worked and yet didn't set the world on fire for whatever reason. About five years later, Samuel Morse sent his first coded message over two miles of wire near Morristown, New Jersey. But he gets all the credit for this. <laughs> he does get all the credit for this, right? And he also came up with his eponymous Morse code, a system of dots and dashes, a digital encoding system to encode text. It wasn't until May 24th, 1844, six years later, that he sent his famous What Hath God Wrought message. He sent that from the United States Capitol to a place called the Old Mount Clare Depot in Baltimore, 44 miles away. Even before the familiar telegraph key, came this first Morse instrument, whose spark set fire to the world of communication. Sure, Western Union was boots and saddles, the golden spike in the railroad tie, singing wires, and the growing pains of a great nation. Other methods of communication were slow and tedious. The telegraph was the only means of rapid communication. It was direct, it was fast. It kept pace with the nation's expanding frontiers. By 1858, not too much longer, there was a transatlantic telegraph cable. It took until October 1861 to connect both coasts of the United States through the telegraph network. Widely deployed in Europe, this was something people needed, and it caught fire. But just like the Industrial Revolution, with its steam engines, replaced people and animal power— Telecommunications had now replaced the range of the human voice. You could say that communication was being dematerialized. Now, for sure, we needed material things to make telegraph lines work. Tens of thousands of miles of cable. But for the first time, the message itself was massless. Yeah, you know, this wasn't sending voice. It wasn't sending audio. It was sending text. And, you know, look, written language is still capable of the full range of human expression. But, Rachel, you know as well as I do, if you're having an intense discussion or maybe an argument with somebody, doing it over text is the worst place to do it. Or the best, depending on your perspective. (laughs) (laughs) Or let's have a serious debate over email. You know, this is not good. Texting is great for a lot of things, but the whole problem we're trying to solve here is extending our voice. And this gets us there a little bit, but not all the way. But luckily, it wasn't much longer. Just 38 years in 1876, after Morse first sent that public demonstration, Alexander Graham Bell demonstrated his newfangled telephone device. Ah, and in the years prior, just like with the telegraph, there were several other failed attempts. People wanted voice, but they were all kind of mimicking the telegraph. People were stuck in that mental paradigm. It didn't work until Bell took a full analog approach. The telegraph was digital. The telephone is analog. I'd love to understand more about the difference between analog and digital in the context that you're using. Yeah, okay. So the way I see it, the world is an analog place. When we talk, we're making vibrating noises with our vocal cords and our mouths, and that sound signal varies continuously. It's not just a pattern of clicks. It's this continuously varying analog signal. Now, if you happen to see the YouTube version of this podcast, you don't have video of me and Rachel. You've got kind of a fixed image with a little wiggly green line in the middle. That's the actual analog waveform of the audio you're hearing right now. The nature of that waveform was not obvious to the people trying to invent the telephone. They were stuck in the on-off paradigm of the telegraph. Now, the funny thing is that modern digital communications absolutely uses on-off patterns for everything, voice, data, images, video. Every phone call you have these days FaceTime call, whatever it is, is being squeezed through this binary paradigm of ones and zeros. It's all digital. And in the modern era, this is done with a device called a modem. We're skipping so far ahead, but just just bear with me for a minute here. 
Uh, so now, if you're old enough, you might think a modem was the thing you used to connect to the internet in the 90s that made the funny noises. You might still say, like, a cable modem if you get internet from Xfinity or whatever. That, that, that language is still with us. But in reality, a modem is a device that translates between the analog world and the digital world. If voice is analog, why bother to make it digital? Why do we do that these days? The reason is noise, all right? Any analog transmission, like the first telephone, is going to have the signal you want, that's your voice, plus some noise from the world. There was noise on telegraph lines, but who cares? Because the click, you know, you press the button down and now this current flows to close the electromagnet on the other end. That's so much louder than the noise. The noise on the line is never going to be big enough to make the electromagnet click. So that's a key reason why digital telecommunications have come to dominate, because it makes it much easier to manage noise. Thank you, because that makes a lot more sense. After a short break, we'll explore Bell's innovation with voice technology. But first, a nod to our finance department. At the tone, please record your message. This is Hannah from Denver, Colorado. Keyboard and Quill is made possible by StarTree, host of the Real-Time Analytics Summit, an annual conference that brings together professionals in the data space to discuss harnessing actionable insights from real-time data. Join us to learn, teach, connect, and have an amazing time with the best community in the user-facing real-time analytics world. Register now at rtasummit.com. I'm Tim Berglund. I'm Rachel Podreski. This is Keyboard and Quill. We're going to keep going with our show on the history of telecommunications with Alexander Graham Bell. So actually, if you dig up Bell's original patent, he references, quote, a method and apparatus for transmitting vocal or other sounds telegraphically by causing electrical undulations similar in form to the vibrations of the air accompanying the said vocal or other sound, end quote. I love that. It was an analog device rather than using Morse's digital one. So Bell rapidly iterated on the speaker and microphone technology, but early telephones were a point-to-point wires between locations, truly a way to extend your voice over a distance without shouting by turning your voice into electricity and then turning it back into sound. But clearly, point-to-point wasn't going to scale. I talked to Dr. Mara Mills, professor at the NYU Communications Department. Yes, that is the NYU Communications Department, founded by legendary 20th century communication theorist Marshall McLuhan. So kind of a cool legacy there. It's a fascinating conversation. All kinds of things about telephony. Let's hear what she has to say about these early networks. Phones only work if they're connected to other phones. So you have to have wires, in some cases wireless. You have to have telephone exchanges because not every phone can be connected through millions of wires, one point to point to each other phone. You have an exchange, which allows a minimal number of lines. You know, before the 20s, you had exclusively had operators because there were no dial tones. It also involves a sonic interface. There's, you know, the design of the handset, but there's also the design of the ringtone. There's the design of the ring. There's the design of the channel and how much speech it can pass through efficiently. It's a massively complex device. So yeah, Mara's talking about the development of exchanges, which is places that your phone would be connected to. Your, quote, telephone instrument had a pair of wires called the local loop, and that would run on towers or maybe underground to this local exchange office. Those exchanges started to get connected to other exchanges through what were oddly called trunk circuits. And so now you've got a way to make a long distance call. Long distance. Millions of times every day in America, a voice on a wire briefly and simply identifies itself in two words, long distance. These two words represent more than the activities of switching and routing. They refer, first of all, to the routes themselves. These routes are special ones, supplied with equipment to make far speaking possible, however great the distance. By connection with the local systems of every area in the land, they form the unified network that pulses with the flow of talk, expressing the activities of industry, agriculture, government, and the home life of the nation. So that's a clip from 1941. You probably would have guessed it came from somewhere around there. And the phone, by then, obviously a transformational technology. It took root rapidly. You know, 30 years of hypergrowth followed by, you know, a more mature but still exponential growth after that. Let's ask Mara more about this. 
So eventually there's this moment right around World War II, telephones become a mass service. It takes that 70 years of the telephone. There's a mass amount of people who have telephones in their homes or in their businesses and are able to use it. And there's a consensus that what a telephone is, is this synchronous live voice communication, which it, it's that was a radical thing because with telegraphy, most people didn't have telegraph systems in their houses. Some people did, but most didn't. So that this full duplex communication, in which we've come to apply to all sorts of forms of telecommunication, really starts with the telephone. It, it always had the potential for so many other uses um, and users that potential and so did engineers. But even by the mid-1960s, people were really starting to see the potential of this telephone. As we look to the future, we see many extras for tomorrow's telephone users. One day, you may be able to call home and automatically turn off the oven. Or, from a public telephone a couple of hundred miles away, turn on your home air conditioner and have the house nice and cool when you return from your hot trip. It may even be possible to water the lawn during that dry spell when you are many miles away on vacation. And you know... All that stuff is pretty much possible now using your phone. Now, not exactly with a phone call, but... And not exactly probably what they were intending there. No, but... Uh, we, the concept is the same. We do have all those things. You can control your sprinklers. Smart. Do you have a smart oven? I do, yeah. You seriously do? I do, and I'm using it today. That is amazing. I was just about to say I don't want one, but maybe you can talk me into it. I well, was... I'm sitting here, and at 4.30, I'm going to push the button, and it's going to start cooking my dinner that oh, I've set up so in there. good. Now, important to note, this was all using wire... This is all wired telephony at this point. The phone itself was a thing that was connected to wires that went to your local central office, your, your local exchange. And it worked great, but it was expensive to deploy. What if we could talk but not use wires? Like, remember how the telegraph kind of began to dematerialize text? Yeah. Wireless is about to push that a step further. Not only instant communication, but more instantly deployable and just transmitted through the air without even needing that material object between you and me. 1864, there's a Scottish physicist named James Clerk Maxwell, and he worked out a set of differential equations, relatively new mathematical technology. So that's what they use differential equations for. So many things. I, so never, I had to take it in college and I never figured out what I needed it for. You, yeah, so he worked out these differential equations to describe the behavior of electromagnetic radiation. So that's light, radio waves, x-rays, cosmic rays, the radiation in your microwave oven, all that stuff. So by that time, people knew there were magnetic fields, but Maxwell's work combined them into what he called an electromagnetic wave. He said this wave could propagate through space. And he proposed this theoretical model, and he got it right. And then in the 1880s, there's this German guy named Heinrich Hertz. Heinrich Hertz devised a series of experiments. He, he wanted to figure out whether this wave stuff Maxwell was talking about was true and whether they behaved the way his math said they would. And he did. He validated Maxwell. He built this apparatus that sent radio frequency energy through space. It wasn't a signal, but he like made a spark on one end and had a primitive antenna and a receiving antenna, and it caused a spark at the other end. It's so funny. He was a lot more scientist than entrepreneur or even engineer. He said of this work, It's of no use whatsoever. This is just an experiment that proves Maestro Maxwell was right. We just have these mysterious electromagnetic waves that we cannot see with the naked eye. But they are there. And somebody asked if there are any potential applications, and he said, Nothing, I guess. But, I mean, it's important to say this was a long time before the 1960s. Like, we're talking almost 100 years. Yes, yes. Before this we is, even went wireless. This is the 1880s. And let's just say others saw the potential of his work. He didn't. And that's that's kind of interesting. The guy doing the basic science is not the one going to build the thing. So many great entrepreneurs of our time. Yes. Again, you have a thing where, you know, it's hard to see what the future is. It's hard to create things. So, but I think it's important to say right now that we've moved from telephone. And in order to talk about wireless, we're going to have to go back to the radio. So our story takes us to a young Italian nobleman named Guglielmo Giovanni Maria Marconi. Ah, say it again. Let me hear the music of it. No. <laughs> so he was aware of Maxwell and Hertz. He had no formal education, but he had a lot of rich guy energy and tutoring. He built a portable, battery-powered, wireless telegraph 
that could send signals about a half a mile. Half a mile. Yeah. Talk about, you know, expanding your voice, you right? You can't shout that far and you don't have to run any wires. And there was this British physicist named Oliver Lodge who did some of the same work that Hertz did, who theorized that was the maximum distance radio waves could travel. Okay. Yeah, no. Then. I, You know, it's better to be wrong than vague. Right. So there you go. So Marconi kept iterating on his technology, making changes like moving his antenna up high on a mast and connecting the receiver and transmitter to the ground. He moved to Britain, patented his system, and demonstrated it to the British government in July of 1896. And he was becoming something of a sensation. <laughs> he performed demonstrations in Spain and back in Italy. He traveled to America in 1899 and installed wireless gear on an ocean liner. Oh, on the ship that he was on. He had, a, he had his little Marconi radio. Cool. Well, he had to keep in touch, right? Exactly. With you, his it, fans back home. I mean, I would want to post my story. Totally. That'll come later. Anyway, so he claimed transatlantic success from Newfoundland to Cornwall in 1901. But that claim is still under a cloud. He knew the signal to listen for, which was three dots or an S, and nobody confirmed it. Oh, so it's just him listening. Yeah. He's like, okay, I, I heard myself. 100% heard those dots. Thank you. The first uncontested transmission was December 12th, 1902. And welcome to the era of radio. And we had telephones at this point. We had analog wired telephones. And this was back to telegraph, just clicks. Radio that could send sound like the telephone now could would come later. And honestly, not too much later. There's a guy named Reginald Fessenden. He was a Canadian-American. He heard about Marconi's work and he thought, hey, you know what? We could do voice with this. Surely we could transmit continuous signals or analog signals through radio waves like the telephone did with electrical current through a wire. He had this idea that in order to transmit, you could produce this continuous wave of alternating current. If you can remember, he took trigonometry in high school, remember a sine wave, the kind of up and down thing? Yeah, that that would work as a radio signal. And he would generate one of those electromechanically and transmit that. Now, the current orthodoxy of the experts in radio at the time believed that you needed a spark, like this big kind of thing to generate radio signals. And that turns out really not to be true. So he put a microphone in line with his little carrier wave generator thing, and this produced an amplitude modulated or AM signal, like the same AM from the AM radio dial. And on December 23, 1900, Cobb Island, Maryland, he sent a voice transmission over a distance of one mile with no wires. It said, one, two, three, four. Is it snowing where you are, Mr. Thiessen? If so, telegraph back and let me know. Not exactly the poetry of Morse, you know, but hey, he's a practical guy. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot more useful than... A lot more useful than the what hath God wrought quote. Yeah. yeah. Eh, less memorable, though. I mean, nobody learns this in school. So backing up a step, we're going to move on in a sec here. But remember, Mr. Hertz, those radio waves are these things, according to Maxwell, that wobble back and forth as they move through space. And the rate at which they wobble back and forth is called the frequency of the radio signal. The frequency of the wobble. The frequency of the wobble. So that wobble has to be created somewhere. Now, in these days, 1900, 1901, we don't have electronic circuits that can do that. In the present day, that's done electronically with a circuit called an oscillator. Well, there was this electromechanical thing, a wheel that spun really fast that had a bunch of few hundred coils arranged on the outside of this big giant wheel that an electric motor spun very fast. This is how radio waves were created in 1901. And these things lasted about 20 years. We had vacuum tubes in 1904, uh, which was a key enabling technology to really make radio work. But it was going to be a little while, you know, 15, 20 years before tubes were good enough to take over the world. And actually, it wasn't even until November of 1919, the technology had advanced to the point where the first entertainment radio broadcast was made. And it was in the Netherlands. Six months later, in 1920, an Argentinian radio station began regular broadcasts. And they had about 20 radio receivers in Buenos Aires. <laughs> Uh, spending into your growth there, right? Yeah, totally. But they beat Detroit by about three days. Detroit News Radio Phone began broadcasts on August 30th of that same year. In 1920, we had radio broadcasts. And this propagated very quickly. By 1925, radio sets were in 10% of households. By 1930, it was 45%. Oh my goodness, everybody was buying one. Right, and so going back to our first episode, how much this made daily life seem so much faster Newspapers were reliably daily and even twice daily at this point. 
But radio brought breaking news to your home instantly. Entertainment as well. It dematerialized information. So now you still had to buy a receiver to listen, but the marginal cost of sending the data itself fell to zero. Life is getting faster. Telecom is getting richer, cheaper, and much more widely deployed. Well, I think we're in the case again where this story is longer than a single podcast episode. So let's bring part one to an end with radio and we'll pick up next time with TV and whatever comes next. Sounds great. Many thanks to Dr. Mara Mills from NYU. You can find links to her work in the show notes. Also, thank you to Coastal Kites for the music you heard during our interlude. It's available on Spotify and Apple Music. Our show is produced by Peter Furia, Noel Gallagher, and Tim Berglund. It was written by Tim Berglund and Rachel Podreski. It was edited by Noel Gallagher and Peter Furia, and our amazing original music and sound design were created by Jeff Kite of The Voids. Keyboard and Quill is made possible by StarTree, hosts of the Real-Time Analytics Summit. Register now at rtasummit.com. You can subscribe to Keyboard and Quill for free wherever you listen to podcasts, including Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. Please leave us a comment and a rating if you have a minute. And if you're a data professional, you should check out the Real-Time Analytics Podcast, which we launched in early 2023. New episodes every Monday, link in the show notes. I'm Tim Berglund. And I'm Rachel Podreski. See you next time.